So thanks so much for inviting me here today, Kelly. It's such an honour to be able to speak today at this, at this uh, conference. Um, and I've been tasked with trying to uh, talk to you about what it's like to be a PhD student and to do research. And actually, when I was thinking about doing this, uh, making the slides for this talk, I realised that it's actually a very, very difficult thing because no two people have the same experience in doing a PhD. And no two people within even the same lab have the same experience of doing a PhD. What I do as a cognitive psychologist, cognitive neuropsychologist, is completely different for the experience of someone who's doing, for example, um, phenomenological analysis. Okay, so what I'm going to do is more specifically focus on what it was like to do my PhD um, and um, hopefully give you an idea of what I've done, how I reached this position, and finish off with a few nuggets of wisdom that have come to me during this process. Okay? So the first thing that um, I wanted to say is that when I was starting to think about creating this talk was that one clear image came into my mind that I had seen online that summarised what I think it's like to do a PhD. And, it's and I think this really summarises perfectly what it's like to do a PhD. And I think that people come into a PhD assuming that it's going to be a linear process like this, that they come in with an offer of PhD, they do one study, and at the end of it, they have a 40,000 word bound copy of their thesis. But it's not like that at all. And what I'm going to try to argue is that um, it shouldn't be like that at all. Because actually, this pattern here gives you much more experience and much wider um, range of skills and qualities that you can then take on into your future career and um, that will help you in, in, in your in your future research. So not only is this um, what I think is the ideal pattern for a PhD, um, I think that people are often pressured into having a kind of linear career structure as, as well. And I think that this symbolizes what people you're expected to go through. So people assume that when you come into university, um, it's a linear uh, path into a master's, into a PhD, and then all the way on to your retirement. But I want to show you that actually my path has been non-linear as well, and I think that that experience has made me a much um, more sort of skilled researcher. It's given me a lot of life experience, and it's actually um, made my PhD much easier. So if I had gone along the linear path, this is what would have happened to me. Okay? But I started off at Glasgow University, and I did two years. And I realized, oh, why am I just sitting here going to lectures when I could be out there in the world um, doing my undergraduate whilst I was also working and gaining experience at the same time? So I left Glasgow and I went to work as a stroke secretary within, within the NHS. And at the same time, but I completed my BSc in psychology through the Open University. And um, it did take a little bit longer, but it gave me a huge amount of experience in working with patients, working um, understanding how the NHS worked, and um, then I was promoted into a research role within the NHS. And at the same time, I volunteered with a stroke club. And only at that point did I feel ready to go in and do my masters, which was working with patients with aphasia after stroke. And you can see that this path has given me so much experience. It's given me life experience. I didn't start my PhD until I was 29. I was able to deal with situations that came up much easier than a younger person would have. I understood the NHS system. Um, I had a degree and I understood how patients, what the, what the difficulties of the patients were when they were back out of the ward and, and living at home again. So then when the position came up at Glasgow to work on a brain stimulation project, a rehabilitation project, working with uh, patients with hemispatial neglect within the ward, they were looking for a psychologist and they were looking for people who understood the system. Um, I literally just walked into that role because I had all of this experience. So I would encourage you, if you're trying to get into psychology, don't think of um, your career path if you're coming, if you're... Um, finding it difficult to move on to the next step, for example, move into a master's or into a PhD, take all of the opportunities that you can and gain this experience because it will help you in your career. So I'm going to move on now and tell you what exactly it is that I do. So um, I work with a phenomenon known as pseudo-neglect. Has anyone ever heard of this before? 
Has anyone not heard of this before? Most people, I would assume. OK, great. Um, so I work in the, um, with spatial attention and um, visual perception. And pseudo-neglect is a really interesting way of finding out what's happening with the spatial attention system. And one way that we, um, one of the tasks that we use to map pseudo-neglect is simply by presenting people with lines that look like this. And we ask people to um, mark where they think the very centre of this line is. So along here, where do you think the very middle of this line is? And people put a mark like this. Everybody think that's fairly centred? Yep. Well, actually, what happens when you look at where the true centre is, it's actually systematically shifted to the left. And this is called pseudo-neglect. And we believe that this is an emergent property of the spatial attention network, in that spatial attention um, is controlled really by the right parietal lobe. This lobe of the brain is very dominant for spatial attention, which means that objects, uh, size of things, the brightness of objects, um, the number of things are, um, is accentuated in the left visual field. So this right parietal dominance um, codes for an overestimation of features of things that occur on the left side, and that's pseudo-neglect. And in addition to working with um, healthy populations, I also work with these stroke patients. And most of you, I'm sure, will have heard of hemispatial neglect. It occurs after a stroke, usually to the right parietal lobe of the brain. This is the, a, a scan of someone who's actually suffered a stroke. And at the minute, there are no, uh, there, this happens to about 80% of people when they come into the ward with a right hemisphere stroke. And it's the single biggest predictor of poor recovery and poor functionality after stroke. And at the minute, there's no clear uh, guidelines as to how this can be treated. So this leads to people um, being unable to wash themselves, dress themselves, eat independently and get about. So this is quite a big topic in um, cognitive neuropsychology is to try and find rehabilitation treatments to try and help people who have this disorder. And now you'll see that we use these same tasks that we use for healthy young people also with the neglect patients. And these patients tend to, instead of putting the, the mark to the left of the true midpoint, they deviate their line really far to the right. So these people are completely neglecting this part of the line and they see this mark here as the midpoint. And you ask them to score out um, all of these lines on the page, and they only score out the objects on the right. And what makes it very clear that this is about attention rather than any visual problem is that even when we place um, objects in their good right visual field, they still neglect the left side of an object. So it's, it's definitely about their attention directing to the left side of space. Yeah, this is a picture, we ask people to uh, copy these shapes into the box on the right, and this is what one of my little patients have done. It's a very cl classic example of, of hemispatial neglect. So what have I done during my PhD? I work specifically with three groups of people. I work with young adults in the mapping pseudo-neglect. I work with healthy older people, because there's evidence that in certain conditions, um, instead of placing the mark to the left of the, of the true midpoint, the older people actually mark slightly to the right of the true midpoint. And we're using these paradigms to try to map um, changes like neuroplastic changes that take place in older people's brains. And also my third group of people is in the neglect patients. So I've been very, very keen to have these three groups um, all throughout my PhD. In addition, I've learned two, well, three-ish techniques, two main um, neuroimaging techniques. So I use EEG in all of these three groups. I use behavioral measures, such as the line bisection task in all of these three groups. And I've also been using a technique, quite a controversial technique at the minute actually, called transcranial direct current stimulation. And I have, um, yeah, so I've, I've, I've really tried to maximize the, all the different things that I do during my PhD and this is I think given me quite a lot of skills at the end of my PhD in order to move on to my postdoc career. And since I'm now in year four of my PhD and my funding has run out, 
I'm now working on a clinical project um, full time as well as finishing off my thesis. And this is funded by the Chief Scientist Office up in uh, Glasgow. And we're working on a neglect rehabilitation clinical trial to um, specifically try to use this technique of transcranial direct current simulation to change the activity on a more long term basis in these patients with neglect. So I am um, not only doing EEG with all of these healthy people, at the minute I'm actually spending a lot of time within the wards doing neuropsychological testing, um, diagnosing with neglect, um, recruiting into a clinical trial and then performing the brain stimulation. So it's the one thing that I have absolutely loved about doing my PhD um, is the variety. It no, it's never the same thing twice. Specifically for this clinical trial, we are trying to reduce hyperactive um, activity in the non-damaged side of the brain. So you'll see that with transcranial direct current stimulation, there are two electrodes. So one is called the anode, which we've got here in pink, and one is called the cathode. And the anode has the effect of increasing the likelihood that the neurons underneath it are going to fire. And the cathode has the effect of reducing the likelihood that the neurons underneath are going to fire. So you'll see that the patients with neglect have damaged here. And the idea is that there is a kind of mechanism that takes place when you have brain damage, that the damaged part um, leads to a hyperactivation of the healthy side of the brain, which means that the damaged part doesn't have a chance to recover. So we're, I'm applying um, TDCS um, every day for 10 days, 10 consecutive days in each patient for 15 minutes a day. And we're doing all of these baseline, uh, all of these neuropsychological measures before the 10 days, after the 10 days, and six months later to see if we can map any more long-term changes in response to this. And in addition to that, we're using um, a behavioral measure so we have shown previously in our lab that by applying this behavioural measure to neglect patients, we can have a three-month effect. And this involves just picking up rods of different lengths. And the patients have to pick up the rods in the very centre. And they, um, because they're, ne they, they're neglecting their left side, they tend to pick up the rods a little bit too far to the right. And they get a kind of um, proprioceptive feedback that they're not picking it up in the middle they then have to put it back down and readjust their grip a little bit further to the left. And doing this over and over and over again for maybe 10 sessions um, seems to draw their attention back towards the left. So we're trying to give people um, TDCS on its own, this behavioral intervention on its own, and then the two things combined to see if the interaction of those two techniques causes a, a, a more long lasting improvement. So I'm going to finish off with a few lessons that I've learned through my PhD. Um, first of all, what I've learned is that not every experiment is going to work. Okay? I know there's a huge, a huge pressure for people to publish. And if you've spent a long time on an experiment, you want to publish that data. And you should attempt to publish it, but just in the knowledge that not everything is going to work. Some things are, sound fantastic on paper. Some things sound fantastic when you're actually running them you come to analysing it at the end and nothing has worked. However, that is what doing a PhD is about. It's for you to learn all these techniques rather than having a guaranteed... I mean, it's nice when that happens, but not everything is guaranteed. Secondly, don't compare your PhD to anyone else's PhD. Um, there's an awful lot of chatter in our department around the coffee machine that how many papers have you got? What stage are you at? Have you written your thesis yet? Whereas some people are doing behavioural experiments, which take maybe a couple of weeks to analyse. Some people are doing EEG experiments or fMRI experiments, which can take years to analyse. So never compare yourself to anyone else, otherwise, you know, there be dragons. Decide what you enjoy early on and develop your own questions. I think it's fair enough to come into a PhD um, taking advice from your supervisor. Um, but ultimately, you need to come out at the end of it with a sense of what you enjoy, because ultimately that's what's going to sustain you in the future. Never turn down an opportunity to learn. 
This is what I'm coming back to about this um, non-linear path. I think it's so important to have all these twists and turns within your PhD. Find someone who's doing a different technique to you. Go and sit in with them with an experiment. Just be able to have a kind of conversational knowledge of their technique, what other people are doing, and don't just stick rigidly to your own path. Number five, hard work usually beats talent. That is like one of the central tenets, I think, of, um, of a PhD. I think that there are quite a lot of people um, who I know, certainly, who are very, very smart, but who don't come into the department until six o'clock at night, maybe do half an hour of work on Facebook and then leave. Um, the people who tend to get things done, the people who are more successful, are the people who put in the most effort. And number six, it's competitive, but it's not a competition help each other and collaborate. I think that's, again, a very important thing. There will always be people who are smarter than you. There will be always be people who have more papers than you. But in order to get everyone through this, you need to support each other and collaborate. So just to sum up, I hope I've convinced you that if you take this path, you might get there faster. But if you take this path, you're going to learn an awful lot more and you're going to be much more successful in your career. So good luck with whatever you do, and I hope I've inspired you to take the right path. <laughs>